Hi, everybody. This is Pasha Marlowe. Welcome to the Let Pleasure Be the Measure podcast. I am excited to bring to you today a guest who I feel like I have known for a very long time. I've certainly been following her and stalking her on Facebook and beyond for a very long time. And yet I have not yet met mm. Jessica Martin in person. I will someday. Jessica is a licensed mental health counselor, life coach, and author. Jessica embraces the concepts of collective wisdom, holistic health, intuition, art, and somatic healing. I can't wait to have this conversation with Jessica because Jessica probably doesn't know this, but she is one of the greatest inspirations of me bringing pleasure into my life. Because one day out of the blue, maybe a year and a half ago, Jessica called me or emailed me. I don't even remember how it went down and said, Hey, my yoga teacher backed out of this upcoming retreat. I'm leading yoga and surf retreat in Portugal. Do you want to teach the yoga part? And I'm like, first of all, I was like, wait, is she, she asking me? And I'm like, I teach yoga, but a retreat. And then I was like, ding, 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 ding. Portugal. And then all of a sudden flooded with memories. I remembered that I was meant to go live in Portugal. In my first marriage, we were, he was in the Navy and we were given a choice, which is funny to move to Portugal or Connecticut. And I was pregnant at the time. And because of my conditioning, I decided with my husband at the time that the best thing, what we should quote, quote, should do is move to Connecticut because then we'd be closer to family. So people would be able to see this baby and um, we'd raise the baby in a place that we were familiar with. I have regretted that decision ever <laughs> since. So I have this sense that I was supposed to live in Portugal for some period of time. And certainly when Jessica called me up and invited me to uh, co-host this retreat, I was like psyched. And so much so, I'm totally going to introduce you in a second, but so much so that that very day, Jessica, I went and I bought this bottle of wine that I'm holding <laughs> up. I know it's a podcast, but some of you can't see it. And it's called Red Blend Portugal. And I drank it. And I have had this on my windowsill ever since to remind me to make decisions based on pleasure and intuition, like go, go the heck to Portugal and do the damn retreat, which of course had to be canceled because of COVID, but whatever, it was still exciting to think about. And then I bought the bag, just assuming we were going to pack, but you see there's still the tag on it. Cause you're like, you have to buy this REI bag, this particular one. And then I actually picked it in orange on purpose, orange relating to the sacral chakra. And I was like, I'm going to go to Portugal. I'm going to teach yoga. I'm going to be free for the first time in my life. I was so excited. And just the thought of it made me excited and embrace this whole new concept for me of living my life through the lens of pleasure and joy. And it, it did not happen up until that point. So believe it or not, Jessica Martin, you are a huge part of my pleasure journey. So welcome to the Let Pleasure Be the Measure podcast, Jessica. That makes my heart feel so good. <laughs> wow. So um, so yeah, I, just hearing that and knowing that, like some of the best connections I've had in my life have come from places and events and things that you, you end up at randomly. Yeah. Or yeah, it's like you meet that one person at that coffee shop that you stopped in and now they're your best friend. You know, like exactly. there's so many cool stories out there of people who just serendipity has brought together. I love it. I love yeah. it. And, and even when we started talking, you would mention things like embodied wellness and your somatic healing. And, um, but then you would mention other more mystical, like you would think, and you would talk about trees and then you would talk about patriarchy and you would kind of like go all over the place. And I love this about you that you, it seems like you are able and willing to, to talk about anything, which I love. Like, I love this sense that you're in it. You're just like so present to life right now that you are willing to engage in conversation about anything that lights you up. I love it. On purpose. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, one of the weird side benefits of being a therapist is you hear everyone else's shit all the time. Right. And so you're, you end up doing this funny thing where you're like, oh, I'm not that crazy um, because everybody else thinks this, but right. no one else gets that experience. 
So there's so many times where I'm sitting with somebody and they finally tell me the thing the thing that they have been keeping in, the the thing that they have covered up, that shame, that secret, that thing. Mm -hmm. And so many times I wish people could see my face. Um, My face is something like, that's it. (laughs) So you like to dance to Janet Jackson in your underwear? Like, that's what you're fucking free flag out, man. Like, that's okay. And, And so, so much of people's joy is just like constipated in them because they're so afraid to even have conversations about it. Yes. So I feel like part of my job is to constantly talk about uncomfortable things in a way that's like, no, if we talk about this, it becomes more comfortable because most of it is absolutely boring and normal. It's not yeah. actually freaky like you think it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love, I love that. And you're reminding me, and we're so alike in this, how we do this through our work. And I used to do it through therapy, but now through the life coaching where we like mindfully put ourselves into situations where we're a little bit out of our comfort zone and we're trying something new and we're speaking our radical truths. And then in that moment of letting go of that one even little secret or the thing that was holding us back, then we're, then we're liberated. I feel like it like opens the floodgates. Even if we start to speak our truths in, in small little bits, I feel like it just feels so freeing that it always snowballs into bigger revelations, which are always healing. Once you can say something out loud, Mm -hmm. that is a desire. That is a secret. That is something inside. If you can speak it out loud and have a human being look at you and yeah. and say me too i see mm-hmm. you i value you the amount of healing that happens in that moment and you're right it, it snowballs but yeah. if i've said this and i had and i received validation what if i say this and and what ends up happening is people unravel because we all have these inside these secret things these desires these things we've been conditioned or told we're not supposed to have Mm-hmm. And when you really like kind of almost like logically think about it, none of it really makes sense. Like right. our bodies are built for pleasure. We have taste buds, we have clitorises, we have all these things in our body that are built just for pleasure. Yet yes. Pleasure is shameful in so many ways still. And it's like, that doesn't yeah. make sense. The physics of that don't make sense. No, it doesn't. And I remember I was maybe 49 when somebody said something along the lines of your innate state is joy. I'm like, huh? Like, what are you talking about my innate? No, not mine. I mean, because I have generations of trauma and inherited grief and yeah. all the things. And, and then I was like, if my innate state is joy, <laughs> I'm like, I, I actually haven't even tapped into my own, my own knowing my own potential. It really rattled me. And then, and then to find out that my innate state is also pleasure and laughter. Like this is a whole new life that, yeah, that yeah. now I'm living once, once you start to embrace that, that pleasure is your birthright and, you know, yeah. laughter is in the cards for you, even if you're in the middle of trauma yeah. and grief, I, that's, that's yeah. mind blowing to me. I remember in a, it was like a high school psych class. Um, there was, they were talking about different cultures and what crossed cultures and what didn't translate and, mm. you know, things like eye contact. Sometimes it's welcome. Sometimes it's not. But one of the things that was universal was laughter. Yes. So the uncontrollable sounds we make are universal. And yes. that is always kind of like weirdly stuck with me that that laughter is its entire, like entire other language is its own experience and it's and universal. And I was watching a program on it and that babies at three months old, even if it's usually three or four months old, even if they're born into war torn families and and crisis, they innately instinctively laugh. And even if they've never seen other people laugh, they Mm -hmm. learn to laugh and they, and they start laughing at three months. And then of course, very quickly, we, we lose it um, because people tell us to either be quiet or stay still or stay to be safe. You have to be quiet or to be safe. You have to stay small. Um, So yeah, it's, it's, something like 300 times a day, a child typically laughs and an adult is, is it's like 10 and that's, oh, yeah. My and, heart hurt. Right. Oh. And, and when I say that sometimes 
people say, I don't even know if I've laughed at all today. And that's when I immediately say, okay, 45 seconds, we're doing this right now. 45 yeah. seconds, even if you don't feel like it, ha 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 ha. And then we, <laughs> then we start, you know, giggling even more because it seems so funny um, and silly and awkward, but I don't care. And 45 seconds later, the mind and body just yeah. assume, you're, assume you're laughing for real. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a relief. I often prescribe baby animal videos yes. in the session. When people are like super stressed out, I'm like, all right, like go watch a kitten video. And they're usually like, what the fuck? My therapist right. is crazy. Um, right. And it, it, there's something about like the universal because play is also universal yeah. and animals don't get shame. Mm. So there's something so pure about watching baby animals play, mm. whether it's goats or dogs or dolphins, it doesn't matter. Like they, they play and it, I'm sure there's science that I don't know to this, but like it taps into something in us yeah. watching something else experience yes. joy. It taps into something in us. Yes. Like, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where I love people watching. It is like my favorite thing. It's the I disaster miss that right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and my favorite thing is watching someone laugh. Mm. Like whether they're looking at something on their phone or they're laughing with somebody else yeah. or that moment where you both see somebody do something ridiculous and then yes. make eye contact. Yes. Oh, that is stardust. <laughs> like that is such good stuff. I agree. I love that. And, and just having somebody watch an animal video or a baby mm -hmm. laughing, it changes our, our chemistry almost immediately. So yeah, I, I prescribe that to my clients all the time. Just like, <laughs> just right before bed, mm -hmm. like, look at a funny meme, watch a quick, yeah. you know, comedy clip, even if it's a minute, it'll, it'll yeah. shift your, your mood. And so one question I forgot to ask from the beginning, just out of curiosity is just how do you define pleasure? Oh, I don't know that I ever have. Um, cause I think when I started this podcast, I had a lot of people say, why are you going to do a podcast about sex and sexuality? And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's actually not at all a <laughs> part of it. Yeah, but yeah. to me, pleasure is such a, such a spectrum of uh, yeah. desires. And so I'm just, I'm just going to ask each of my guests because there's so many yeah. variations of it. Um, yeah. The definition in my head, like doesn't have words. Uh, it's like that's kind cool. of the concept of if, if laughter can't can't necessarily be defined. Like laughter is an experience yeah. that bubbles up and makes a peculiar sound that is like shared mm -hmm. and has its own like biochemistry to it. Yeah. But if you were to define laughter, I'm sure there's some science right. definition, right? Of like the movement of your diaphragm. Yeah, but it wouldn't feel like, right. Well, yeah, it doesn't match. Like that doesn't match. It's like defining the color red doesn't yeah. define. So is there a color pleasure. or an image that comes to you when you think of pleasure? It, it's the experience. It's, it's being present and enveloped by something almost with, with the lack of shame with the lack of all those things it's like what yeah. it, what exists when you take all of that away and yes. you're just in a moment enjoying whether whether it's a sandwich or whatever it is you know it's right. that kind of and that's I think that's what I always try to teach and, and live myself is that pleasure exists in in opening up a chapstick and being like oh banana you, you know <laughs> like you know like loving the smell and the feel of it on your skin and it exists in tiny little things as well as like basking on a beach in Portugal, you know? Like <laughs> and that's so important right now for us to realize yeah. that we can access pleasure in these tiny ways that you're mentioning and that is cumulative and that it still brings the same effect, right? Well, and I think if you can't do the small ones, mm -hmm. then the amount of pleasure you receive out of the larger ones, mm -hmm. it, it's not the same. You know, like if you can't be happy with the, with tiny little things, then you're simply chasing something that's going to make you happy. Yes. And we know that that doesn't work. Like you can't make someone happy. You can't make yourself happy by arriving or doing a thing. It's, that's what I mean. It's like almost like laughter. It's like in an innate sense inside yourself, it's like a chemical reaction yeah. that 
that exists because you're experiencing something and your perception of it and how you're involved in it. I love that. I yeah. love that. I love that you mentioned the stepping away, like releasing shame and stepping away. Yeah. And I know for me, when I suggest people start tapping into their pleasure, I say step away from, if you can these days, mm -hmm. even if it's a day or a weekend away, and then ask yourself without the kids and the yeah. partners around um, and your laundry and your dishes, <laughs> what do I actually want to do? What do I actually, what would I actually like to wear? What do yeah. I actually want to eat? And when we, when I ask people, you know, what do you enjoy? What brings you pleasure? Yeah. There's often a blank stare that goes upon somebody's face when I ask that. And there's this sense of all already they're starting to think, well, well, my kids like this, my partner likes this. Um, this is what my yeah. work allows me or my finances allow me. And then we're already filtering it through yeah. all these things. So to step away and be yeah. free of all that for a moment is really eye-opening. Well, I think pleasure requires a certain dash of gratitude. Yes. So there has to be a certain amount of thankfulness and appreciation of the moment. Mm. You know, even, even silly things like laundry. I get to do laundry. I get to do this. And that's where I would say people like, um, this is a weird thing, but um, I use the dryer balls, the little wool things and okay. I use essential oils on them. Oh. Um, and they smell delicious. Like I purposely pick the, the recipe of essential oils so that my clothes smell good. And Wonderful. so there's something to that of like, even just in tiny moments, like what can I adjust so that it's something that brings me some sort of joy. So when I open the dryer and I smell my clothes, it's like, oh, yes. Even if it a minute, and I have to be present with a slight amount of gratitude to be able to be like, yes, I have clean clothes. You brought pleasure to laundry. I love it. I love it. I, and I think those tiny little, I call them tiny habits. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if we can bring small bits of pleasure into anything, what, and you had mentioned the soap earlier, you know, when we're washing our hands, like all the time these days, right? Yeah. Can you wash your hands with a nice soap? Can you put a nice lotion on? Even when I'm washing dishes, I just turn the water on a little bit warmer than probably my partner would like me to for energy consumption. I don't really care. And I just, because it's soothing. And then all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more pleasurable. Yeah. And so when you think of when we're tired, right? Yeah. There's like, I'm physically tired. There's I'm spiritually tired. I'm creatively tired, right? There's all like versions of being tired mm -hmm. and you have to kind of do the corresponding rest for the remedy. So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're physically tired and we look at doing something that might creatively spark joy, that doesn't match. Mm -hmm. And so I often think of like the more in tuned we are to our pleasure, and the more we are in tune to gratitude, the better we're tuned to like what type of rest and energy we need. Like it, it all kind of snowballs together. Um, and the more you can be present in that, you can kind of prescribe something for yourself that really matches. So if you're really tired, you actually are physically tired and you just need a nap, the thought of climbing into a bed where your sheets smell nice and your blankets are nice, mm. that feels right. Mm. Like it's, it's way more relaxing than thinking, oh, if I push my laundry to the side <laughs> and, I, you know, like, <laughs> and I get in that bed, like one yeah. innately just feels better. So in adjusting the small little micro things in your life, yes. it makes it so the other action steps you take for pleasure are more productive. They're actually more effective. I love that. I wonder if that would be a fun exercise. Maybe you do this already with your clients. Is like pick the thing that just you just dread. What you know, the chore you dread, the errand you dread, whatever it is. And then, and then, how can we create that to a, a moment yeah. of pleasure? How can we start to reframe that a little bit? So be, I had this interesting uh, experience that has kind of leaked into the rest of my life around this. Okay. So um, I am a Jeep girl, and uh, this summer I, I bought, um, a new Jeep and, uh, yeah. Woohoo. And like, it makes me so fucking happy, uh, just to drive around with no top on. What um, color is it? It's black. And it's, it's all, which is like, when I thought about, I want this Jeep, I had like aqua in my head. Like I wanted the Barbie Jeep. Um, 
And then I ended up at this dealership and my Jeep is actually really masculine. It's black, black interior and big black wheels. And it has like an angry bird grill, but I don't know. I love her. And like, awesome. <laughs> but it came with satellite radio, okay. which is something I had not had in a vehicle before. It means there's no commercials. Ooh. Yes. Nice. And so all of a sudden driving around without the top on in the summer, yeah. all of a sudden there was no interruption by like the Cardi furniture people or oh, a car okay. dealer. Like it was just music. And, and because I had purchased the Jeep and kept the subscription, I got Alexa for free. Wow. It was, oh. yeah, I know it was a great package deal. Um, and I was like, mm, big brotherish. That's weird. I'm not sure I want this in my house, but I was like, it's free. I'm going to get it. Sure. So now I walk around my house and right before we started this, I was like, all right, I need, I need a little pump. What do I want? And I was like, Alexa, old school Janet Jackson, please. <laughs> and I danced around my house to like miss, miss Jackson, if you're nasty. Um, That's great. But just the ability to add a, a whim, like at the, the slightest hint of a desire yes. to say, this is what I want. Yes. And to have it magically appear. Well, not magically. I mean, right. but like magically appear. Alexa magic. Yes. I, I love magic. about Alexa. Alexa, play me a song that'll make me cry. Alexa, play yes. a song that'll energize me. Yes. I need a fun fact about frogs, please. In exactly. This moment. exactly. Um, Tell me a joke. Um, it's so I'm, funny that like it keeps going. So mm. like I now find I'm more attentive to my mood sometimes and if music would help it. And mm. I'm someone who in the past six months or so, has embraced dancing. That was one of the last bastions of like, we don't move our body that way. Okay. Uh, and so there was some stuff there. I think old school, like Catholic dance nightmares um, <laughs> were, were in there somewhere and like not, not feeling comfortable moving my body in a sexual way. Yeah. Even if it was just for me. Yes. And when I'm home, I often will turn it on and I find myself dancing more. And a good friend of mine is a, to she, um, she would constantly like, Jess, like, let's do dancing. Let's, let's dance this out. And I would be like, my body doesn't move that way. That doesn't work for me. Um, we have a joke where I, I literally, she's, she's trying to get me to do it because I'm like in a thing. And I literally like a child was like stomping my feet and was like, Katie, I don't do that. And was like having a meltdown. Um, now I'm like, oh, there's something in my hips right now. I got, I got to yeah. get that out. Um, yeah. I, well, just before, just before yeah. we met, I was like feeling a little funky and stuck mm -hmm. and I'm not one to break out into dancing either. I'm working on it. Cause I, <laughs> I know that once I tap into that, I will love it. But there's this part of me that it is, um, like the armor is still thick and that that's a little too maybe unsafe or vulnerable or something. I don't know. Like I'm worried about what it'll unleash. I have this sense of something inside of me is like, and maybe it's rage. And I'm like, maybe I'm scared that it's going to come out as anger. I don't know, but I, it's that's bubbling part up. Of it. yeah. I've been conditioned that could, because you can't have joy. You can't have intense joy Right. without recognizing your other emotions. Exactly. Like we can't selectively numb it out. We can't be like, I'm just not going to feel sadness anymore. Like <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> work that, that. down. Yeah. yeah. And so as women, I think we've been collectively told to kind of stay vanilla, stay in this box, can't mm -hmm. get too much that way or too much that way. Mm -hmm. And so there is almost this kind of like, I'm going to open this floodgate yeah. and all of this stuff yeah. that has been in there is going to be free. Yeah. But I think if you keep going with that, then what? Then if what? I no longer follow that rule, what does that mean for all the other rules I followed? What does that mean for all the other safe decisions I've made? If I take out her, right? Because I'm a big believer, your inner child, when you heal your inner child, she becomes your old crone. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like in healing your inner child, if you unleash that old crone who gives zero fucks, mm -hmm. like now what? Mm -hmm. And there's almost fear there. It's like, oh, then I'll have to live to my fullest emotional potential. And it's almost scary. It is. It is. And I love this, the inner child image because 
what I did instead of dancing was simply hula hooping without a hula hoop, just circling my <laughs> hips 10 times one way, 10 times the other way, because I know it starts to loosen things up in there. My, my sacral chakra. And, <laughs> and already I felt a little bit better. And it occurred to me while I'm doing it, I'm like, well, if this feels good, then other <laughs> things would feel good and dancing even more would feel good. And then I start to think back into childhood loving dancing, loving movement. And right before this call, it's like, when did that stop? When did that stop? And, and it's, it does come down to a sense of um, safety, which I think is important because some people don't know how to access pleasure because pleasure, it, it has correlations in their mind to mm -hmm. being in danger or um, being coerced or yeah. even abused. And so allowing ourselves to feel worthy of pleasure is, is a big job and, we're, and it's going to take a lifetime of, of work and healing. To well, find I think that. it's interesting as a yoga teacher mm -hmm. that you have, must have seen this all the time where someone maybe physically is capable of a pose, definitely, but trusting their body, particularly I'm guessing some of the poses that, um, put your body in a more vulnerable position. Yes. And so really being able to let your body bend into something, allowing that fluid kind of like mm -hmm. that, that's pleasure. Mm -hmm. Allowing your body to stretch out and feel is pleasure. Absolutely. And how often did you witness people kind of stiff and unable to like sink their hips in or open yeah. up that leg? And yeah. yeah. Well, interestingly, a lot of the postures that, that, seem to hold a lot of blockages are the hip openers, but also heart openers. So anything that's super vulnerable where we're opening our arms out wide, our, our chest is out yeah. and we're like, look at me, you know, we, we, I think as women often, um, to protect ourselves, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, come into a room and like, don't, don't show off all of our <laughs> assets, yeah. you know, chest out, tits out, all that. And yet in yoga, often we're asking people to do that. Mm -hmm. And we're going into these postures that, um, that can often be triggering. So yeah, there, there is an aspect of that for sure, for sure. And of course, in, in the safe and empathetic environments that we can create, whether it's by ourselves in our own bedroom or with people that we love and trust or with, within sisterhood or with a yoga instructor or a therapist that you trust to start to, um, bring, bring that movement and that opening in. And it could be as simple as lying in your bed, with a bolster behind your back and allowing the, the heart center yeah. to open and just realizing like, oh, okay. My yeah, body yeah. needs to do this, feels good. This yeah, feels I'm good. thinking of the first time I ever took a restorative yoga class. Yeah. And and like not understanding some mm -hmm. of it, like watching everyone like pile blankets and things around them okay. and being like, I don't really understand what's happening. Like, why do you need all of that? Yeah. And thank God the instructor that um, was hosting this class with somebody I had taken classes with before. So she kind of ignored when I was like, no, I don't need any of that. I'm fine. And then like halfway through the class, I can remember laying with the bolster behind my shoulders, yeah. arms out and just being like, <gasps> like where, where is this coming from? I, I'm not sure about this. And her coming over and like tucking that blanket over me that I had said I didn't want. Exactly. And, and that oh. feeling of being so vulnerable yes. and then having someone put on a layer of tenderness okay. and then I can remember her tucking the blanket in and just the water like yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even tears it was just water yeah. at that point and like that emotional release in yeah. there like how much we store we oh. so do yeah well, my favorite part of teaching yoga is tucking tucking people in at the mm -hmm. end and a lot of times it's this realization of I have been tucking my kids and my spouse and my parents, like I've been tucking people in my clients. I've been tucking everybody in, but no, he's tucking me in. And this is like, Oh, thank you. Somebody's bringing me a blanket and maybe even rubbing my feet for a moment or putting their hand yeah. on my forehead or a, a drop of essential oil on my forehead. It, it goes a long way. It's what goes to like pleasure requires gratitude. Yes. It also requires connection. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the big almost like I want to say injury, the big injury of COVID is mm -hmm. how disconnected we are physically and how much healing can come from that. 
you know, particularly people who don't, you know, whether they're single or don't have big tribes, you know, and right. just that idea of, of a touch of the hand or you're yeah. right, like a, a, a hand on the shoulder that something mm-hmm. and how much we're, we're depressed, mm-hmm. how much we're missing that. Absolutely. And so even more important to, even if it is through the soap mm-hmm. or a gentle mm-hmm. caressing of our own bodies, the self-worshipping, yeah. um, all so important. And yeah. um, I want to make sure, because one of the things that I loved always in, in hearing you talk is about just the the possibilities, like this idea of possibilities the potential, the sense that our, we we have our identities and how we can evolve those over time. Um, I've always just been really fascinated by your by your beliefs around that and how when we can start to identify as people who are worthy of mm-hmm. pleasure, how that opens up possibilities for other things and yeah, unlimited unlimited yeah. potential. I love, I love that. I love watching that. I'm sure you do too, watching that, that transformation yeah. in your practice. It's, it's all the story. It's all, yeah. like, if you've told yourself a story about your identity, about your roles, what you're good at, what you're not good at, all of these things, it, at some point, if you can own that, if you can own that in our childhood, we co-created them. And then as we aged, we took on more ownership and we, we wrote these stories well, if we can acknowledge that that's true, it means that at any given moment, you have the power to rewrite your story in a way that fears, feels more connected, that feels more authentic to you. Yes. And if it doesn't work, you just keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> Write it in different ways. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's, 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 there's no time. It's not like five minutes from now, you can choose something different. There, there's no, you have to cross a threshold. There's no, if you've never taken a yoga class, there's zero stopping you from turning on YouTube and becoming a yogi. You like, want to be a vegan, have at it. You Go want it. to cut all your hair off, <laughs> excellent choice. Like you can do anything. Yes, and I then, love that. Yeah, and then like, it's just your mind. If you can see it, if you can think it, then it can be possible. Yes. You just have to keep going and until you figure out what you like. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And that's why I, I was thinking about this podcast. I was like, what do I want to call this? And I was like, how do we make decisions that lead us to these grand opportunities and open up yeah. the possibilities and become more expansive? I'm like, well, if pleasure is the measure, if that's how we're determining what we want to do with our day, our week, our year, our life, um, well, then that opens up a whole lot of fun. And so when I was doing my holistic personal training, which I enjoyed. I thought I enjoyed it enough. And I thought, what would even be more fun? What would be a job I can think of that would be thrilling and exciting Mm -hmm. and challenging? And I'm like, comedy and healing with humor. This felt way out of my comfort zone. But as soon as I decided, and then put it after my name, life and laughter coach, and so it is, and so it shall be. And then all of a sudden, by the way, everybody starts assuming that I'm the one who appreciates humor. So my inbox immediately went from being flooded with stories of trauma to being flooded with stories of humor. And sometimes the two combined that how we can heal trauma through humor. But I thought this is fascinating. I've completely adjusted my perspective, my personality, my lifestyle, Mm -hmm. and my friends and my Facebook and Instagram followers. Like it was transformed overnight that this is amazing like and all I did was ask myself what would be the most beautiful way to work and and play in my job okay yeah I think it's really interesting our our brains Mm -hmm. don't they don't really understand the word don't or yeah or not Mm -hmm. so if you're constantly focusing on something that you don't like your brain is essentially being told this thing is really important. Let's create a funnel so that you notice it more. Mm -hmm. So you think about like, if you burned my finger, right? So like, I'm so weirdly peculiar right now of like, Ooh, that finger hurts. Don't touch things. So I'm like weirdly walking around with that finger out and I keep hitting it on something. I'm like ET right now. Um, (laughs) And so like, I keep weirdly hurting it more because I'm walking around with my finger out. 
<laughs> and so it's like our brain is the same way. If you're constantly walking around, you're like, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. Your brain yeah. like, God, this is super important. And it will funnel things in. I don't like red cars. If you repeat that to yourself enough oh, times, goodness. you go to the store later on, you're like, God damn it. There are red cars everywhere. <laughs> Where if you're like, so Jeep owners do a thing. We do the Jeep wave to each other. And there's a Jeep wave. Oh, there's a Jeep wave. Ooh. And there's like several different ones. And if you, wow. yeah, there's a whole thing. It's a whole okay. culture. Um, no right. Idea. So if you're driving with me and you don't know that passengers, every once in a while will be like, what? do you know them? Do you know all of the Jeep? Who are <laughs> these people? And you're like, no, it's a club. It's like motorcycle uh, Harley guys do it too. Um, <laughs> and so it's a funny thing is I notice all of the Jeeps. Yes. And people will often not notice them until they see me do it. That's great. And so it's a funny thing is like, they, Jeeps are important to me. I see them. You see it. You see, see it. Me. It's like a thing we do. And oh. so you notice it more and more and more. So if you think about your life that way and you think through the lens of pleasure, yes, as opposed to the lens of fear, if you think through the lens of pleasure and you think about all the things that you love, and you want in your life, yes, you show up more. You yes. start to notice them. You put more value on them. Then you start to make more decisions to that bring more of that in. Absolutely. So it, yeah, it's like that pleasure being the measure. Pleasure is your lens. Yes, it's, it's there. Yes. If you if you try to think of pleasure as the absence of other stuff, then you're simply concentrating on what you want absent. You're not actually concentrating on pleasure. Exactly. It's like people who are like, well, you know, what do you enjoy? And they, they like, oh, well, like I'd really enjoy being on a beach in Tahiti right now, but that's not happening. Yeah, no, no, right. And it's right. like, well, what do you actually enjoy? You mm -hmm. didn't, you didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, I don't like be away from this, being away from the cold, being away from this bullshit. Mm -hmm. Again, you didn't actually tell me what you like. You, mm -hmm. you told me you don't like don't the cold. Like. So you're not actually telling me what brings you pleasure or joy. Mm -hmm. And our brains hear that. Yes. And what if that person just wanted to be warm inside their bones and a sauna could do it or a right. hot tub treatment could do it. And I'll say, oh, I don't have to go to Tahiti. I just need it to be really warm from the inside out. Maybe you need some vitamin D and a hot tub. Like, what? <laughs> like, and, and, and if you think through that lens, oh, I can, I can make that happen. Yeah. You, you know, like all of a sudden it's like, well, there's a, there's that place there's a place near me that has the, the red, the infrared light saunas and, and, the, right. and the steam rooms. I, I could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, and suddenly it's possible. And it's now possible. you go do it. So now you've done it and you really like that. So you do it every Thursday. Yes. Create space to do it more. Yeah. And suddenly like, and your body feels good and you have something to look forward to. Like it's a whole system that happens as soon as you change your perspective. Yes. I'm grateful for something. I can achieve this. This is this brings me joy. I like this. My body feels good when I do this. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. If it's your lens, it, the world changes. Absolutely, absolutely. So empowering. Yay! Yeah. I feel like we can go off on many, many pleasure <laughs> tangents, um, more than perhaps the podcast uh, time allows. So you did write. I just, I just wrote a book. It's coming out in a couple weeks, and it's called "My Next Husband Will Be a Lesbian." Talk about opening up my eyes to new possibilities and expansion. I was like, wait a minute. Well, I'm living under the constructs of somebody else's rules about. How am I supposed to express my own sexuality? That's not, that's not okay. And that just opened up a whole, a whole other, um, you know, floodgate of, of emotions and actions, which is awesome. Yeah. And you just wrote a book um, that's already out mm -hmm. called Bring Your Own Money, Bring Your Own Drugs. Yes. Bring Your Own Money, Bring Your Own Drugs. <laughs> I was like trying to figure out what is this book about? when I was reading the title and I was like, well, it's Jessica. It could be about trees. It could be about monkeys. I have no idea. What is this about? It could be. So that is a line that came from a conversation I had with this really amazing woman who, um, who had great life stories because she had unapologetically lived her life. Mm. And she was talking about it's almost like what it was like a sentence in a conversation that started the waterfall. And then like 20 minutes later, you're like, and, 
and then what does that mean? And well, well, what about that? Right. And so she was, she was talking about, um, she was an avid concert attender um, for, for fish and like had done that thing where she had like just followed them around the country for a while. Okay. And it's really funny because the age group in which she did that, I was making like completely opposite life decisions. <laughs> so I was like, what? Um, and she's the CEO of her own company now. So like all of my images of like, you dirty hippie, like what? But it was like, you are wildly successful. So yeah. clearly so I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she was talking about her younger sibling who uh, was turning of age and wanted to go do the, the fish experience. And she was like, yep, um, there's there's some of my friends left who used to do this together, we will take you, but you have to bring your own money and you bring your own drugs. And at first, she told this story to like a group of women and we were sitting there and we we're like, yeah, that's important. And then all of a sudden it like snowballed into, right, how many times have you prostituted yourself for something that you want? Because you didn't have resources so then someone else got to make decisions about your value and your worth because you were unprepared. And she started talking about meetings um, with her company. Like there had been offers to sell her company kind of thing. And she talked about like, this is what I wanted. And if I could go to this meeting prepared, knowing my worth, knowing my value and not needing someone else to, to show me or give me that, I owned the boardroom. Mm -hmm. I could walk in and say, this is the amount of money I want. These are the things that are, are non-negotiables. This mm -hmm. is, and be like able to stand up and walk away if I wasn't getting exactly what I needed. And you, I watched like a circle of grown ass women. We all were like, yeah, that's, oh God. Oh God. Whew. And like go through the emotion wow. and thinking about, so the book is a collection of stories and, uh, and moments in my own life, as well as watching these experiences happen for clients and watching them own something and then their, their life trajectory just change. And like, what happens if you stop valuing your entire life based on the circumference of your thighs? What happens? Hmm, what if you blowing. own those bad tree trunks and you fucking love them? What, ha like what happens? What happens if you go to the gym and you're like, I could squish your peanut head with my thighs. Get out of my way. What I got diamonds in there. <laughs> right. What happens is you, you stop having someone else determine if you are allowed in that space. Yes. You stop asking permission and you start doing, mm -hmm. and then you start walking different. You start owning your space different. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens if right, pleasure? Yeah. What happens if you decide that I actually don't like that? This is what I like. What happens if you start voicing that? Yeah. What happens well, if, right, for a lot of people, a lot of women, the way we view our vagina is the way we often view our self-worth. So if we don't like her mm. and we're shameful of her, mm. we often feel shameful of our bodies. We feel the need to hide. We feel the need to be polished and pretty and all of these things that are untrue change ourselves somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Cause just this week, my assignment to my roar with laughter group was to write a letter to your vagina or from your vagina. And, and sometimes that turns into the comedy routine. Cause there's so much truth to that, that that's yeah. where we, we hold a lot of our beliefs about our, yeah. our worth and shame and conditioning. And so, yeah, very powerful. Um, and I, yeah. yeah, what a book, how fun. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was fun to write um, because it brought up so much of my own stuff. Sure. Um, th yeah, there's the, a woman who helped me birth the idea had mm -hmm. been telling me for a while, like you tell great stories, you should write a book. And I was just like, what the fuck would I write about? Like, <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah, right. But, and then one day we were sitting at a coffee shop and thank God, like she just was so attuned to what was happening. And I was like, I had this idea. And all of a sudden it was like, I was possessed. Like this thing was coming out of my mouth. And it was almost like I was like watching something come out of my mouth. Yes. And I remember looking at her and her looking at me and she like took a notebook and like, I am it over. This. <laughs> and it was like, you know, and I just spewed for a little bit and, she, and we were both like that. 
that's the book. That's it. Well, holy crap. Yeah. Um, and it was a weird sequence of events where that happened. A glorious friend of mine who was a creativity coach and she's brilliant was holding a workshop that I had set up for her mm-hmm. on creativity and like birthing your dream. And again, it was like two days after this and I'm sitting next to her and the woman who had witnessed it is sitting on the other side of me who has been involved with publishing. And she looks at me and she's like, well, like what dream are you birthing right now? And I was like, and a woman across and I was like, but it immediately went from here's my idea to here's all the reasons I can't. Here's mm-hmm. all this fear. Mm-hmm. Um, which ended up being about, I would not, have a dress to wear to my book signing well then it per- it worked out perfectly with covid you can <laughs> you, you launched this book during the pandemic with your pajamas on i assume right well and the woman across the circle from me was like wow are you having a book signing like next week oh <laughs> you need help shopping and i was like no i just had the idea yesterday <laughs> the book isn't even out yet i need a dress <laughs> Oh, every time someone poked at it, I became a toddler and had like a complete meltdown yeah. over but it. But you did it. You published it and it's out right now, right? It is. It's out. How it's can people find it? Um, Amazon. 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 The easiest one. Yeah. Um, if you go to my Instagram page, Embodied okay. Wellness, so it's an underscore between Embodied and Wellness. Okay. Um, there's a link in my bio for the book. Great. You can get it that way or just straight through Amazon. Yeah, that way it's brilliant. Like as much as um as as much as I learned during the whole experience, one of the things about like self-publishing was a great way for me to go. And Amazon had a fantastic program where you literally kind of like upload what you've written. Unbelievable. You can, yeah, you can design it from there, which got rid of my whole fear of like, but someone's not gonna like it at a publishing house and they're gonna cut it up and make it into other things. And it was like, yeah. <laughs> None of my fear is real. (laughs) And you didn't need any dress and you didn't need to get dressed up. (laughs) Perfect. It's perfect. I love it. So um, thank you. You let us know how to find you on Instagram, embodied underscore wellness Mm -hmm. and your book. Anything else? Any other things coming up on the horizon that you want to share? Yeah, there's a few little things. So um, there's going to be a a coaching group coming out that's going to be a little small and intimate. So taking like three people through the process of creating whatever dream it is. So almost like the book, it's like, okay, what's your dream? What are your fears? How do we get you through this? What are your action steps? And really like, you know, pushing through something. Um, There's some bigger things like that. There's also in February and March, there's going to be a bingo sheet that you can download from my website, um, embodiedwellness.blog in which it's literally a bingo sheet of February is going to be self-love. So all little things, all little micro self-care to do. And you, you can do it along with me on Instagram. So I'll be posting my version of it and like the things that I'm doing. Uh, And then March is going to be um, be self-love. And then the next one is body stuff. So really focusing on like healthy body and the connections there and loving our body. So kind of like, you know, everything from, maybe you should have a glass of water and go for a walk to like, maybe you should love your vagina. There's a little bit mm-hmm. of all of it on there. Mm-hmm. Good, so, good. Yeah. And it bingo. So it's a game and it's fun. Right. right. Love it. And yeah. it's visual mm-hmm. and tactile potentially too. Yep. Awesome. All I the love senses. it. You can smell the paper. All the senses are involved. Pleasure abound. <laughs> so Jessica, the final question that I ask of my guests um, is on those days, those shitty days mm-hmm. when everything's seemingly going wrong um, and it feels very dark and heavy. How do you still sprinkle pleasure into those days? Uh, the first part of that is I don't deny it. I let myself have a tantrum. I will let myself sit on the kitchen floor and, and stop my feet and say, I don't like this. This isn't fair. I, I did not plan for this. You know, I'll let myself have a little bit of a tantrum. Mm -hmm. Then after a few minutes, I get, you know, it's like, I allow that full expression and then I get up for me. I, I love being outside. So generally I will go for a walk. I will do something outside, even if it's just standing on my deck for a few minutes and just breathing, you know, really like working my lungs. Beautiful. 
and then I will go do something I enjoy. Okay. You know, so it's like, I let myself have the crap yes. and then wallow in it. I get myself, literally physically remove myself, get yeah. some fresh air in my lungs and then come back in. And that's when it's like, all right, why don't you turn the music on? You like move your hips a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it could be indulging in something little that, mm -hmm. that I really love. I keep sugar-free dark chocolate chips in my cabinet and a handful of those sometimes yeah, that'll do it's it, like, right? yeah it's like <laughs> i'm a big believer in like if i'm gonna have a cookie i'm gonna have a cookie it's, it's gonna, gonna be a whole good. Cookie. yeah like it's gonna be good i'm not i'm not shoving store-bought chips ahoy in my throat like yeah. that's not gonna do it for me so i am a believer in that stuff of like indulging in something mm -hmm. i will say if it's a really shitty place flowers i'll go to trader joe's i'll go, go buy yourself some flowers and i'll go buy myself flowers yeah beautiful yeah. I love that. And I love that all these ideas are accessible to yeah. almost everybody. So, yeah. Right. Like, I mean, I'd love to go to Tahiti and sit on a beach too, but like, that's not always possible, exactly. right? So, exactly. Yeah, like, move my body in some way. And then I kind of go through the senses until yes. I figure out the one that really connects. Do I need something to indulge in taste wise? Do I, mm -hmm. like, what do I, um, is it a shower? Do I go take a shower? That's like, I love the smell of my shampoo. So like, do I go take a shower and like, really indulge in it do i you know go get flowers like what sense what sense feels connected to the crap i get it and that makes so much sense and i love to move through the senses i think that's beautiful and i think it's something sometimes when we're in the middle of the crap it's hard to remember our tools like sometimes yeah. i'm having a panic attack and i literally forget that i'm a yoga instructor who teaches people to right. breathe I'm like, how am I not remembering how to breathe? Oh, I teach people to do this. So something uh, like go through the senses or sometimes I'll say, go from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, check in something yeah. really easy um, or name five things in the room you could see, like bring yourself back to a moment of, yeah. of presence. So I love that. Yeah. I think the, tan the tantrum helps me separate the bad moment from myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm not bad. This isn't bad. I am having an experience that's uncomfortable, but it's not me. It's right. separate than me. It's in a, it's a moment. So sometimes like really indulging in it and letting myself have a tantrum about it. By the time I'm done, it's like silly. So oftentimes there's a little <laughs> bit of laughter in there. It's like, all right, for love of God, like you're a grown ass woman, get off the floor. Um, I have dogs. So they often will come over and they're like, what's happening, mom? What's happening? Oh, on the floor. You know, so it's hard to throw a temper tantrum, you know? Um, sorry, they said they have the licking you now yeah, and now they're climbing. Yeah. Now you're laughing. Yeah. Yeah. One's a puppy. So he's like, this is fantastic. I love um, your temper tantrums. Mom. Yeah. Yeah. And That's so but in, something in there helps me separate. So yeah. I'm not in it. It's yeah. happening, but I'm not in it. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Such brilliant wisdom from you as always, Jessica Martin. Thank you. Thank it's you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure talking to you. I love it. And I hope that we can connect again soon. And I hope that all of the listeners um, reach out to you through Instagram, buy your book. And uh, yeah. And if anybody wants to reach out to me and continue the conversation, you can find me at pashamarlo.com. You can email me at pasha at pashamarlo.com. And on Facebook, I just opened up a new Facebook group called Midlife Mischief and Merriment. So that's a fun group full of pleasure and laughter, humor, but also the radical truths of what is actually going on in our lives um, yeah. and how we can hold all of that in a single moment, just like we were talking about today. Yeah. Yeah. So, super. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks everybody.